Hello! In this video, I'm going to review basic concepts in immuno-oncology. Immuno-oncology is a new field. It's the field of the 21st century. Or is it? New York Times, July 29th, 1908. I encourage you to look at this publication. The whole paper is really very interesting. In this article, they interviewed Dr. William B. Coley of New York. What he did was to use the observation that some patients with cancer who also happen to acquire erysipela. Now, erysipela is an infectious disease of the skin caused by Staphylococcus aureus. It is not as common nowadays as it was then, especially as a hospital infection. So what he actually saw was that several patients with erysipelas who also had been there for treatment of cancer had what everybody was talking about as a spontaneous cure from cancer. So what he did was to take the blood from his patients, isolate the bacteria, and use the toxin from the bacteria. It's very interesting again to read this paper. I really encourage you to do it because in the interview he explains that he is not injecting the bacteria or the infection to his patients. He is purifying the toxin from the bacteria and he has created the coli toxin for treatment of cancer. And he hypothesizes that it's the immune system of the patient that is actually seeing the toxin, responding to the toxin, and at the same time, dealing with cancer. So interestingly, it took almost 50 years for his daughter, Helen Coley Nautz. She pursued uh, his father's career. Uh, they actually developed the Coley pharmaceuticals to sell the Coley toxin. And she did the actual experiments that demonstrated why these patients were getting a cure. So in a nutshell, what this publication is uh, showing is that what they did was to culture erysipelas. And the first step, they used the toxin, the coli toxin, uh, directly on tumors. Nothing happened. The tumor was perfectly okay. So the next thing they did was to take blood from patients who had actually uh, not uh, had uh, been exposed to the erysipela or the ones that had been exposed to erysipela. And this blood from patients with tumors were actually uh, now incubated with tumors. And the ones that had not had the infection or the exposure, let's say, to the toxin, the tumor was again perfectly okay. It was the blood that had come from, from individuals exposed to the toxin the ones that she demonstrated they were tumor necrosis. Furthermore, they isolated from this blood and they saw that there was a circulating factor. There was something in the blood and it was a pretty large molecule as shown in this picture. And it was actually present in the cases of the serum that was able to cause necrosis in tumors. It was absent from the other blood. So the hypothesis that they issue in this paper is that what happens is there's this factor, and they called it tumor necrosis factor. It's a protein that causes necrosis in tumors. Where is this protein coming from? It is not in the toxin, because injecting the toxin directly does not kill the cancers. What happens is the toxin stimulates the immune system of the individual and it is the immune system, the cells of the immune system of the individual, the ones that produce the tumor necrosis factor and they actually cause the death of the tumor or the cancer. So this was a first use of the immune system to treat cancer, which is what we know as immuno-oncology. From the time, from the time that Coley described it in 1898, it took over 100 years of research, of further understanding and characterization of the immune response to cancers, and then 
finding out how we can use them to get the first FDA approval of an immuno-oncology therapy, which was dendritic cell vaccines, followed very quickly by the first checkpoint inhibitor for cancer, very soon after the first CAR T cells for leukemia, and very soon after the second checkpoint inhibitor. So from that time, we are seeing a tremendous amount of opportunities coming just in 2015 and from 2015 to date in terms of immuno-oncology approved therapies and they continue to be more and more developed for different kinds of cancer, different kinds of immune system response, etc. So what is immuno-oncology? Uh, it's in a nutshell is harnessing the immune system to treat cancer. So easier said than done. We first need to understand what is the immune system response to cancer and why doesn't it respond always? Starting from the middle top in orange, you have the tumor growing in any particular site of the body. The dendritic cells are the first ones that will encounter the tumor. They will actually phagocytize it and then they will be able to present the specific tumor antigen. So these are the neoantigens. The tumors mutate and they present an antigen that is not normally present in healthy tissue. These dendritic cells travel through the lymphoid vessels and in the lymphoid nodes they present this tumor antigen with appropriate co-stimulatory signals to the T cell that then gets very specific, it specializes itself to identify this particular antigen from the tumor, it proliferates and it actually will become activated and migrates. It migrates through the lymphoid system until it finds the tumor and there is where the T cell is going to be killing the tumor. Uh, if you want more specific information on how this whole process works, I do have other videos in YouTube. In uh, this paper, the interesting thing is they actually looked at 124 published articles. So what I'm showing you is on the y-axis is the percent of articles that are published and in the bars, the light blue is when the effect on the prognosis of the patient was good. In purple is when there was no uh, effect. And in orange, poor prognosis. And then we have five different categories. What these papers actually showed was that it's unmistakably good response when patients were uh, identified as having a profile on their T cells that's either CD8 positive, CD45 rho positive cells, or they also were identified as Th1 cell. So these two phenotypic descriptions of their T cells was uh, clearly uh, an association in more than 90% of the papers with good prognosis. What we see in the next categories is not as straightforward. The Th2 cell profile is more likely to be associated with poor prognosis. However, it doesn't always associate with it. But in 50% of the papers, Th2 was identified as poor prognosis, whereas 25% of the papers, Th2 was identified as having good prognosis. The other 25% of the papers, none. So give or take Th2 may actually not be very good for cancer patients. Uh, the story with the Th17 and the T regulatory cell profile is a bit more of a flip of a coin. So what are exactly these T cell phenotypes and why uh, can we actually make uh, any sense of what we're seeing with this publication? In another YouTube video, I actually have explained a little bit more in detail this uh, phenotype of the TH cells.
But basically, we have now, basically there's uh, four or five phenotypes identified. Very clearly, the Th1 phenotype is the one that is associated with T and F, tumor necrosis factor. We shouldn't be surprised that T and F uh, is going to be present in that phenotype that is associated with basically good prognosis, which is the Th1. The Th1 profile also is associated with the uh, interleukin-2 secretion and interferon gamma. And this is uh, very associated with inflammatory responses, killer responses that will pr produce inflammation. The Th2 response, on the other hand, is basically more uh, associated with the vasoactive response in allergy. And it's driven by a completely different set of cytokines. If you can see there, it's basically the interleukin-4, 5, 13, and 25. And this is the one from the graph that I showed you before is more associated with uh, poor prognosis. Now, the TH17 profile is a profile that is driven by many different cytokines in the milieu, and it's characterized by the IL-17 and IL-21 production. There's also TNF-alpha produced. So the TH17, as I mentioned to you, same as the T regulatory profile, were less clear, probably more of a flip of a coin. In the T regulatory cells, which actually dampen the immune response from the other TH phenotypes, what happens is you have tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-2, interleukin-6, interleukin-27, producing this particular T regulatory cell. So it's sort of a flip of a coin. If you happened to have a response for good prognosis, a typical TH1, then having the regulatory cells dampen the TH1 may not be very good. On the other hand, if you had a TH2 response that is more associated with poor prognosis and now you dampen that response with the T regulatory cells, it might actually end in good prognosis. These uh, cytokines also is very interesting that they have some sort of different mechanism for regulation. So first thing is you see that one of the products of the TH1 differentiation is interferon gamma, which is also one of the stimulants for the differentiation into TH1. So there's a little bit of a feedback loop there where inflammatory response TH1 will augment itself as it is producing the same cytokine that stimulates and activates the TH1. Now, on the other hand, the interferon gamma inhibits the differentiation into TH17. Interleukin-2 inhibits the B-cell isotype switch in the allergic responses. On the other hand, the TH2 also produces IL-4, which is one of the factors that stimulates TH2. So it's again another feedback loop of augmenting its own production. But interleukin-4 inhibits the differentiation into TH1. So what we can see here is that basically this TH1 or TH2 would be very predominant in one individual, individual, either one or the other. So the characterization of which one is the profile in a patient with cancer is very useful because we're seeing now that one of these profiles, TH1, has associated with better prognosis and it actually happens to inhibit the TH2, which is associated with poor prognosis and inhibits the TH1. The TH17 also produces its own cytokine IL-21 that further stimulates, stimulates it. And it does have inhibitory uh, effects on the differentiation of TH1 um, and also inhibits the NK cells. So in the TH1, it's difficult to say exactly. It's like I said, a flip of a coin. And as I mentioned before, the T regulatory cells can actually occur after any one of these pathways is activated and it will dampen any one of these. So depending on what the patient is having, if the T regulatory cell is the predominant one, it will dampen the results that could include the production of tumor necrosis factor, which as we 
So from Dr. Coley's toxin is actually helpful for patients. So going back to this graph, we can now have a better understanding of what this means. Furthermore, what I wanted to introduce also to you is the paper in immunology uh, that shows um, the paper I quote in their immunology in 1994, CD8 positive, CD45 row positive cells produce interleukin-2, interferon gamma, and TNF. This is the profile of the Th1 cells, and the main result is TNF. So tumor necrosis factor in the cells that are either characterized as Th1s or characterized as CD8 positive, CD45 row positive cells. Either way, it's the interferon gamma, interleukin-2, and most importantly, TNF, tumor necrosis factor profile. They will have better prognosis. So what is happening with the Th2s? You're more likely, if you have a Th2 response, you're more likely to have a poor response rather than a good response to the cancer. The Th2 phenotype is characterized, as I mentioned before, by the production of interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. These are cytokines that will produce EGEF stimulation, VGEF. Basically, they're very angiogenic. So they promote not only tumor growth, but also metastasis of the tumor. And on the right bottom corner of this slide, remember that the Th2 inhibit the Th1 profile, which is the one that will produce the tumor necrosis factor. So Th2 phenotype, when, when patients are unfortunate enough to develop the Th2 phenotype and they have cancer, more likelihood of having poor prognosis is also associated with uh, favoring the angiogenesis that allows the tumor to grow, to metastasize, but also indirectly by inhibiting the own patient's Th1 response that will produce a tumor necrosis factor. So uh, it is very important to understand the different responses of the immune system to cancer and how can we harness it for immuno-oncology. The therapies that we have been using in the past is basically immunosuppressant therapies. So that's well and good when our immune system is actually not helping us, like in a Th2 response. But immunosuppressant therapies may actually not be the ideal when our immune system was actually getting a good response to the tumor and we're now suppressing it. So the immune response to cancer is important to harness it and it's important to understand it. And what I'm going to explain today is two of the immuno-oncology treatments that have recently been published, as I mentioned, since 2000. And 11. The checkpoint blockade, which is breaks on the inhibition of very specific immune response, and the CAR T cells, which mean chimeric antigen receptor cells. So what is the role of co-stimulation? Uh, in general, when a dendritic cell is presenting an antigen, the antigen will actually be identified by the T cell in red, through the T cell receptor. Now, this naive T cell will not respond because the CD28, which is the co-stimulatory ligand, that CD28 is hanging. It doesn't actually identify anything. So T cells that only have presentation of antigen with no co-stimulatory signals basically do not respond to the antigen. When the danger signal is perceived by the dendritic cell, they not only present the antigen, but they are becoming activated. And the activation of these dendritic cells will express the co-stimulatory molecules, which in this case is depicted as the B7. So the difference between the top and the bottom is that now you see the dendritic cell in salmon color expressing the purple B7 co-stimulatory factor that will engage with the CD28 from the T-cell, and this is what activates the T-cell that has been identified specifically by the specific antigen presented via the T-cell receptor. And here's our friend, the interleukin-2, 
which as uh, you remember interleukin 2, TNF and interferon gamma are basically the Th1 responses. So now there's going to be an effector cell that will be able to kill the tumor. Now the story with co-stimulation is very complex, it's not as simple as that. As you can see here, uh, the B7, 1 and B7, 2 molecules, both of them engage the CD28. So the top of the cartoon here is a presenting cell and the bottom of the cartoon has the T cell with the red uh, co-stimulatory factors from the T cell. They look very similar, but their action is opposite. So when you have the same antigen presenting cell activated with a B7, either one or two expressed, they can engage the T cell by either binding the CD28, activating the B cell, the T cell, sorry, and uh, making that T cell kill the tumor, or they can engage this new thing, the CTLA4, which actually inhibits the T cell. So these processes are very important to understand because the difference between the two of them have to do with affinity and, and avidity of this binding. And they are self-controlling systems for the response of the T cells. I encourage you to read a bit more about this in detail. But the important message here is that the same co-stimulation from the dendritic cell in green can engage either the activation of the B cell or the inhibition of the, of the T cell. A similar thing happens in the periphery. When the PDL1 and the PDL2 are going to engage the PD1 uh, co-stimulatory factor of the T cell, and this is again a regulatory mechanism. In this case, the activated presenting cell will actually start telling the T cell to come down. So these are all regulatory mechanisms of the immune system in a normal circumstances. So when we have the antigen presenting cell, in the middle it's presenting the antigen, that in this case is in green, and in pink you have the T cell that has a T cell receptor in the middle, and it can either be engaged by the B7 through the CD28, in which case the T cell will be activated, or through the CTLA4, in which case this T cell will be inhibited and will not respond to that particular antigen. So a modality of treatment in cancer was using anti-CTLA4 antibodies that would be blocking antibodies but not stimulating. In other words, it's like a, like a chewing gum stuck in your shoe. So basically what this is doing, it's just blocking the CTLA4 but it's not activating it. So when the antigen presenting cell presents now the tumor antigen and it's activated with B7, it only has one other co-stimulatory available ligand on the T cell, which is the CD28, which leads to activation of these T cells. So when you are using CTLA4 antibody, what is happening there is that every tumor antigen is being presented and it doesn't matter how high amount, how low amount, these particular T cells identifying that antigen are going to be going after it. But the anti-CTLA4 is blocking all the CTLA4s in all the T cells. So we need to watch out because Basically now all the T cells that are presented any sort of antigen by the dendritic cells that are activated will be engaging CD28, will be active. This is a different way of showing what I mentioned to you before. In green is a dendritic cell that is activated. In blue is the T cell. And if you see there, uh, what we are depicting here within the lymph node, within the primary lymphoid organ, what you have in there is the 
MHC is presenting the antigen, in this case it's a little yellow ball, to the T cell receptor in salmon color. And the B7 is expressed because the dendritic cell in green is activated. What happens in the blue is that this individual is treated with anti-CTLA-4 antibody and so the CTLA-4 co-stimulatory ligand is not free to engage with the B7. So the B7 that is expressed in the green cell, which is an antigen-presenting cell, can only activate the CD28. Now remember I mentioned to you about the PD-1 and the PDL one These are working in the peripheral tissue. So the CTLA-4 works in the lymph nodes. In the periphery, we have again in blue the T cell, and now we have in orange the cancer cell in the peripheral system. So this T cell is being presented the, um, the antigen to the T cell receptor, and again the cell is activated by uh, having PDL1 antibody that normally would bind the PD1, which is inhibitory. So remember, this mechanism is exclusively inhibitory, and it's the way that many cancers can escape the T cell control because they would be expressing PDL1 and they would be inhibiting the T cells in the periphery. So, whereas the CTLA4 inhibition works and the lymph nodes in the central tissue, once it goes to the periphery, these T cells could potentially continue being inhibited by the, per the peripheral effector phase. So the PDL1 or the PD1 inhibitors, these antibodies to either of the two, can block this inhibitory mechanism. And that's how we have what we call the check point blockade. So the checkpoints are these mechanisms of co-stimulatory signals that the T cells have to avoid having a perpetuation of an active disease. So normally there's activation and inhibition. And most importantly, there's an inhibitory mechanism in the periphery. Now, in the situation where we have a cancer growing that has escaped the immune vigilance, we actually do not want to have more inhibition on the T cells. So by using either a blockade of this checkpoint in the lymph node using CTLA-4 or in the periphery using an antibody to either PD-1 or PDL one is going to help the T cells to be completely uh, in, uninhibited from the activation and killing the tumors. Furthermore, there's been the idea of combining checkpoint blockers, and it's already been done for the CTLA-4 and PD-1 checkpoints, and the results are truly dramatic. So it is very useful to have not only one point of blockade, but using the blockade on the two of them. The possibility is also of using any one of the checkpoint blockades with another therapy, so combination therapies, it's also been pursued in active research and they could be either an agonist antibody that can activate some, uh, some of the uh, receptors or it could also be a kinase inhibitor that can target uh, a, a particular cancer or an oncogene. So this blockade, uh, checkpoint blockade treatments are not necessarily the end of the story. They have opened a new chapter and a new hope for patients with cancer. Now, if we are blocking the inhibitory mechanisms of the T cells, evidently these individuals are walking with a constant perpetuation of an activation of T cells to any kind of presentation. So there's, uh, they're prone to have autoimmune reactions, inflammatory disorders. They will react to anything 
dramatically. Of course, if they are reacting to danger, that's good. You know, if they're reacting to uh, infections, those T cells are really primed to act. But if it is uh, another situation is that they can lead to these uh, autoimmune reactions. Evidently, the risk-benefit of this treatment has to be considered patient by patient. And if the patient has cancer and the cancer needs to be treated, uh, the uh, lookout for potential autoimmune disorders developed is very important in the clinic follow the patients and see if they're having any of these manifestations and then follow them up once the treatment can be discontinued, the treatment for cancer. The next um, immuno-oncology big area is the CAR T cells or the chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So I wanted to start with the blockade because there's an association of the systems and understanding the blockade is a first step to then understanding the CAR T cells, in my opinion. So what you have on the pink, on the left, is a CD4 T lymphocyte and then on the right is an antigen presenting cell. So the first thing is that you see there the um, signal transduction elements or um, receptors on the T cell membrane and you see the T cell receptor. The T cell receptor is the one that will specifically identify the antigen being presented by the class 2 MHC from the antigen presenting cell. But the T cell receptor in the internal domain, the intracellular domain, does not have a signal transduction motif. So that is the reason why when presented by the, by the antigen presenting cell without having any other signal transduction, any other uh, signals for antigen presentation for co-stimulatory signals, then that cell does not respond because the T cell receptor has no way of activating internally. The domains that internally will produce phosphorylation and activation and signal transduction basically is the CD28, the motifs that have the item motif like the CD23. Uh, and uh, you have then that expression. So this is the reason why when you see the antigen presentation with a co-stimulatory signal that, like the B7 that we discussed, it will engage the CD28 and it is this moiety, the one that will activate for a signal transduction inside the cell that makes this a killer cell. And in addition, it will help express the adhesion molecules that attract these T cells to the site where they have to be doing the killing. So the T cell receptor, which is the one that has the specificity for the tumor cell in this case, unfortunately does not have the ability to produce a signal internally and produce the killing. It needs the other co-stimulatory cells. So uh, the idea was to use a tumor-bearing patient, isolate the lymphocytes from this individual that actually will identify the tumor, expand these cells, and then you, what uh, happens with these cells is that they are transformed. So in the rectangle in the middle, what you are seeing is basically what these chimeric cells are. So the cells from the patient are taken into culture and their T cell receptors are transformed. They are engineered. What you see here now is a T cell receptor with a VH and the VL loops extracellularly. And now inter intracellularly, we have engineered the item motifs and the CD28 intracellular motifs. 
So you take the, the intracellular signal transduction motifs from their respective receptors and you no longer need a co-stimulatory signal. You only need the T-cell receptor engaging with that antigen to produce signal transduction and activation. We got rid of the need to have a co-stimulation. On the other hand, because these are done with the patient, these are very specific for the patient cells that identify the specific tumor antigen. So this particular therapy is a therapy that has shown, and as I mentioned to you, it has already been approved by the FDA to produce tumor regression in these individuals is very specific to the patients, very much uh, uh, individualized medicine, and what you see here is basically a T cell that no longer is dependent on having the co-stimulation. The success is remarkable, especially for leukemia. Um, there's a risk of cytokine storm, uh, and this has been actually seen in publications. I will explain that in the next slide. Uh, but yes, there is a risk of cytokine storm because what happens now is that these T cells, again, by not needing the co-stimulatory signals and by having the T cell receptor uh, directly active and capable of mounting a response, it could be really out of control. And the other question that, that happens is, you know, what happens is if the tumor now mutates and loses the particular antigen that was identified by this T-cell receptor. Now we have a chimeric antigen receptor T-cell in the individual that's no longer useful because the, the tumor mutated. Do we do the chimeric antigen receptors again with the same individual, we, do we try again? What's going to happen when there's variants on the tumor? So there are several different questions, but there's a lot of promise. The first generation of the CAR T cells basically had, as I mentioned to you, the variable region light chain, the variable region heavy chain, VL, VH, from the T cell receptor. And intracellularly, they were, they were actually included the CD3 uh, internal signal transduction motif. On a second generation, uh, the biologist said, well, why do we stop there? Why don't we put also one co-stimulation domain, like the CD28, plus the CD3 signal transduction domain? So why don't we put two? And then on a third generation, why don't we put more than two? Why don't we use other co-stimulation domains? The possibilities are really probably not endless, but many, especially as we learn more and more about these T cells and how they work. And this engineering can go on, and we can have T cells that are actually super T cells that will be basically uh, responding to very small loads of antigen with a tremendous internal signal trans transduction. So in the laboratory, the possibilities are many, and many of them will make it to the market, hopefully. But there are limitations. First, I mentioned the cytokine storm. And uh, in the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine of 2014, the first children that were treated with, uh, they had uh, uh, blood cancer. Uh, basically, what they saw is that the cytokine uh, responses were basically interleukin-6. So their recommendation and what they did was to treat them with anti-IL-6. So there is therapy for that. There's a, a potential for that, and especially when you're treating uh, lethal disease and you know what to expect and how to treat it. But of course, there's a risk of uh, long-term damage. Remember that we're actually uh, introducing an engineered T cell, but that T cell, once we put the genes in there, can reproduce. And it's going to be there. We don't know exactly for how long, uh, you know, could be there for the life of the individual. So it is very good 
for a first approach, very potent, and it can deal with a specific antigen, but these T cells have the uh, capability of remaining there as memory cells for forever. So the other thing is that they work very well in uh, blood tumors, but in solid tumors, the problem is that these CAR T cells would need to also get to the tumor. So it is a little bit of a problem to know exactly how can we bring these T cells, these uh, very potent T cells, that now just with a T cell receptor can have internal signal transduction to the tumor site. Evidently, this can be uh, worked out, but it's, uh, it's another one of the challenges, and it's a reason why the first ones were in uh, hematological tumors. And so the other problem or a challenge uh, is what if the tumors uh, escape this system by now mutating and losing the antigen that was identified by the chimeric T cells. So the tumor could develop resistance to the CAR T cells. The CAR T cells could be memory cells remaining in the system, but the patient could actually have a recurrence of the tumor by the cells that developed the resistance to these, to these T cells. And, and finally, evidently, there are technical and regulatory challenges because this is personalized medicine to the utmost. It's not only individualized for the patient, but also for the type of antigen the tumor is identifying. And, of course, this is very difficult to produce uh, and have it ready for a variety of patients and a variety of tumors. So this is very hopeful for patients with cancer, but it's also a bit challenging to make sure that we can generalize it and have it for many patients with many cancers. So the current work and research that's geared on the CAR T cells is a prospect of being able to have a gene-edited universal CAR T cell. Is that possible? Can we have a human universal T cell that doesn't have to be from the patient and that has this ability of having the T cell receptor activated without needing co-stimulatory signals? So basically, there's a lot of things going on, but as you saw, the checkpoint inhibitors are critical, they're very important, there's a lot of work going on, and CAR T cells are the two elements I wanted to discuss as part of what we call today immuno-oncology, but that probably all started in 1898 when Dr. Coley started treating patients with the vaccine. Remember that the 1908 publication was already over 15 years of experience that he had accumulated treating patients with cancer. The hope is that there's going to be a lot more to come. Uh, there's a lot of therapies that are being researched and assessed, and we're understanding better and better the immune system and cancer so that we don't treat patients with immunosuppressants. We harness the immune system to treat cancer. I hope this uh, talk was useful and I hope you followed it correctly and it's clear. I also have other videos in YouTube that you can access for understanding more in depth immune system. And I will put the description of these references that I used to create the different uh, slides. I'll put them in the description below so you can access them also. But you know, I encourage you to see other videos and read other references. Thank you very much.